Ja sam Blajan Kojmunovski, Machine Learning Engineer u Symfony. Tukaj sam veke godina i pol i radim na dosta interesni projekti od ovlasti na Machine Learning. Jeden projekt v koji što ga koristi za Transformer beše Relevancy Scoring, kada što vsušnost za talen tekst treba se outputi nekako v Scorpi, ki kaže da je tekstot relevanten za to što se pišu. Tukaj ga koristi na ovdje mreži. Se ja možemo da pročemo na mislim. Ok, introduction. As I've mentioned, uh, natural language processing has seen a lot of advancement in the recent, in the recent years. In the beginning, uh, everything was statistical, so people wrote complex handwritten rules to do, to do most of the tasks, but nowadays uh, deep learning, uh, I mean deep learning changed the game, so we, we use deep neural networks to do the, the, um, the, the, the NLP tasks. Um, in the recent years, the transformer architecture um, um, I mean, took off, and it's used to solve almost any task. Uh, as I told you, it's a neural network architecture, but it's, it's kind of different. I'm going to explain, explain it in, in details so you can understand how it works. Uh, these models are, are large, but they're not difficult. So how large are they? Uh, the most recent model that was developed, it's by Microsoft, and it's called Megatron. It has around uh, 5,300 billion parameters which is pretty large. Um, and the model that, I, that I've circled there, GPT-3, that's the one that we've used to, to do the, the, the text completion. Um, so it, that one is also large, but it's, I think, four times smaller than, than Megatron. Why do we even care? I'll give you a brief amount of time to read these two poems by Wallace Stevens. And one of them is actually written by Wallace Stevens, the other one is not. Actually, it was written by the Transformer. And at the end of this presentation, I will tell you which one was there. So I'll give you five minutes to check it out. That's it. This is the first one? Maybe the, the first paragraph is enough. Okay, this is the second one. I mean, they're probably indistinguishable. Not in terms of the text that was written, but in the style of, of the poem. Uh, what's even more strange is that these models can do arithmetic. Um, Text completion was something that was solved pretty early in, in, in the whole NLP uh, sphere, but nowadays these models can infer, uh, sorry, can reason. So here you have a question that was uh, taken out from a textbook uh, for, I think it was elementary school uh, maths, and on the right there is an answer that was produced by the transformer. So you can see, I mean, basically the model it didn't output just a number to answer the question it output an explanation of how it solved the problem. Bigger is better in this case. And here on the x-axis you can see the number of parameters that the model has. On the y-axis is the accuracy. And the top line, the dotted line, is the human performance on this uh, SOTA task. So you can see as the number of parameters increases, the accuracy of the model basically goes uh, to the human level of reasoning. And as we've seen in, for example, image uh, in computer vision, uh, where models basically surpassed the, the human level of, of reasoning, we maybe expect this to happen also in, in LLP. And one of, um, one of the Australian philosophers has something to say about this model, is that one of the most, these models is this model is one of the most interesting and important AI system that was ever produced. On to our next topic, which is machine learning background. Uh, here we are going to talk about um, some helpful concepts that will help you to understand the, the model, uh, the transform model better. First, we are going to talk about model selection, then activation functions, regularization, classification, and we'll end up with representation learning. Guys that know machine learning maybe know all of these concepts so you can go and just wander around <laughs> and come back in 10 minutes. Uh, so this is a neural network, a vanilla style of neural network. It has 
three hidden layers and two uh, other layers, which the leftmost is the input layer and the rightmost layer is the output layer. The circles are the neurons, which are initialized with some values. So for example, at the input layer, you can imagine that you have, uh, let's say, an image, and the leftmost pixel is assigned to the topmost neuron, the next one to, the, uh, to that pixel is assigned to the second, and so forth. Actually, this is not how it's done. There are different kind of architecture for this task, but it makes the, the problem easier to, to, to envision. Uh, then the lines that you see is some kind of transformation. So you go from the, uh, the space where the image is, you transform it into some, something, some other image that you don't understand, but the neural network understands what it is. And then you go so forth, so the, the, the information flows from left to right. Uh, once the image is processed, at the end you have some value. And depending on the task that you're trying to solve, maybe it can be a classification. For example, there is, if there is a person on the image or, or there isn't a person on the image. Hot dog, not hot dog, if you remember. Uh, or maybe other task. Uh, this output layer can have multiple values depending on, for example, if there are multiple objects that you try to classify on the image. For example, if there are 100, the output layer would have 100 neurons. And the ones, the one neurons that fire up or have the highest, the highest value, those are the, the values that, that the, the image, for example, contains. But I don't like this image because it's kind of cluster, cluttered. I'm going to use this, one, this image to explain the concept. It's almost the same, and at the left we have the input layer, at the right we have the output layer, and the hidden layer in between. I've decoupled the, the actual transformation, which is called linear, here, and the activation function that that, that layer uses. And I'm going to tell you uh, a, bit of, a bit about both. First, model selection. So uh, the image that I showed from the neural, ne neural network has had, for example, three hidden layers. But what's stopping us from having, let's say, one million hidden layers? Or uh, these uh, hidden layers to be wider? Or what kind of activation functions are we, are we using? This problem is, is considered in model selection. How do we do model selection? Well, we, is, we use our data here. We split the data into three parts, 60%, uh, 20%, 20% ratio, and we name them train, validation, and test set. Then we chose one parameters for the neural network, the width, the depth, whatever, whatever, and then we train it using the 60% the of the data set. Okay? Then after, after the model is trained, we evaluate with the validation data set. Now we have a model and a metric. Then we choose another set of hyperparameters, do the same procedure, exactly the same procedure, and we have another model and another uh, value for the metric. After we've exhausted the whole hyperparameter space, we chose the model that had the higher value, higher performance metric. Then what we do is we take the train and validation set. This is how it's done nowadays. We take the train and validation test, join them together, train the model once more, the one that had the best performance, and then we evaluate on the test set, on the last piece of the of data set. That's the value that we report. That's, that's how our model performs. In this section, I'm going to ask you several questions. So uh, I would like you to keep attention. The first question is, can we train, and this, this is not for the <laughs> machine learning folks, can we train and evaluate without splitting the data set? The left answer is yes, the model will have high accuracy. And the second answer is no, even though the accuracy is high, it's not the correct performance value. So who is for number one? Maybe raise your, your hands. Who is for number two? This is great. Uh, yes, even though the accuracy will be high, if we use the full data set, uh, the model can learn all the data set by, by heart and output the, the correct value in each case. But that, that, that's, not, uh, that's, not, that, that's not something that we want. We would like the model to perform well on something it hasn't seen. On to our next topic, which is, basic, which is activation functions. Uh, as we said, uh, neural network is nothing more than a transformation. So you start with an image or with a textual representation, whatever, and then you transform it such, such that uh, the output uh, value, it's easy to, to, to classify, the task is easy to, to accomplish. But this transformation without the activation function is linear. So it can only, for example, move points in space, it can scale points in space and so forth. But we would like to add some non-linearity. For example, if you do clustering in your data, 
and your data is, for example, in the ring, and it's easier to cluster, for example, if it's in a square, then you would have to add some non-linearity non because linear transformations would not accomplish that. How we do that? We do that by adding activation functions. And by the way, I'm going to write some, some, of, the, some of the math stuff here. Uh, some of the most important activation functions that are used nowadays is the ReLU, which is basically you take, you take max of the of, of max between zero and the input value. The function it looks something like this. So you basically clamp. If the value is negative, you set it to zero. If the value is positive, you just take it as it is. Uh, this is uh, really um, widely used uh, activation functions. Uh, activation function. Another activation function that it that it's used, for example, in the transformers it is GLU or Gaussian error linear unit. It's it's this, you take the value x and you multiply it by the probability of a random variable having values uh, larger than x, where x is simple from a question. It's really similar to, to rectified linear unit, it just looks something like this. And it's shown that, for example, if you, if you use Gaussian linear unit, the model performs better, trains faster, etc. So these functions not only add non-linearity, but also improve model performance. So you have to be wise of how you choose activation function. So that's why you do, for example, model selection. Another question, is it okay to remove activations altogether? One is yes, the model will train faster, or two, no, the model will behave like a factorized linear function. Factorized just means linear after linear after linear after linear transformation. Number one, anyone? <laughs> number two, there we go for number two. Okay. It's true that the model will train faster because these activation functions can be a bit nasty, but as I've told you, we, we need to, to have that non-linearity. Uh, another topic is regularization. Um, as I've told you, model, uh, if you train the model, I mean, if, if the model is really deep and it has a lot of parameters, like the case with, with Megatron, it can, happen the model, it can happen that the model learns everything by heart. So one way to mitigate this is to add regularization. Uh, one thing that is used um, in, the, in the transformer is dropout, where you basically just cancel neurons. Uh, for example, when you, when you have an image on the input, you say that the first, eighth, tenth, etc. do not work on the first layer, on the second layer you choose another, etc. And then you pass the image. Once, once you get another image, you cancel out different neurons. Uh, this is how dropout works. Zone out is similar, but instead of dropping, it preserves some of, the, some of the neurons. Here in this case, it's in a different kind of architecture, which is called the recurrent neural network, and it preserves the, the hidden states. <laughs> which of the following is a regularization technique? Train multiple models than average the precision, penalize high model parameters more, or decrease the depth of the neural network? This is a multiple choice question, so uh, maybe I can answer this one. It was, <laughs> if someone knows the answer or, or wants to step up. Jan? <laughs> yes, number two is one of that uh, regular safety technique. Another? No, three is not. It can it can help, but uh, as we said, we don't. We can have as deep model as, as we like. So we don't want to penalize the architecture. We like to penalize the, actually the parameters. So action number one is is uh, is a is a regularization technique that we could use. So we train basically multiple models with different parts of the data set, and then. Uh, then we average the prediction of all. This is something like a wisdom of crowd principle that is used. Uh, classification is something uh, that's consi that, con that's, that considers the output layer, or classification is one task of machine learning. The other one is, uh, this is uh, for supervised learning. The other one is called regression. For classification, you uh, classify um, categorical variable. So for example, whether there is a person or there is a no, there is not a person in the image, or which person is there on the image, for example, whether it's me, Jan, or me and Jan, I don't know. 
how do we do classification? Well, you use also a different kind of activation function. Uh, in this case, for the binary classification case, you can use um, where you, for example, classify where, whether there is a person on the image or, or there is a not, a not a person on the image, use uh, the sigmoid activation function, which is this, x being the input value that was output from the neuron, and this activation function produces a probability value. So if x is large but to the negative, then the probability that's outputted from this activation function is close to zero. If the value, this, this x value is large but positive, then the value is close to one. So the network is sure that there is a person on the image. For the general classification, where you, where you have, for example, uh, multiple persons that you would like to distinguish between, you use the uh, softmax, which is this. E is, is a constant, the, uh, the Euler number, 2.7 something. And then you normalize uh, across all predictions. So how this looks is that the output vector from the neural network, when you normalize it, is basically an, a probability distribution. So for example, this value has the highest probability. Uh, and then you, 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 you say that, for example, uh, that person or, or thing appeared in the image. What if, what if we like to classify uh, multiple, uh, for example, multiple sentiments or, for example, multiple person on the image? Which activation functions would we choose? Are we going to use the sigmoid or are we going to apply the softmax? Softmax? Sure. No. <laughs> we are not applying softmax because softmax outputs probability distribution we would like to check the probability of each one of those. So we would apply sigmoid, but element-wise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final thing is representation learning. Uh, computers do not work on textual data. It doesn't understand text. So we need to transform text into something that the model can understand. What the, model can, what the computer can understand is numbers. And uh, this is basically representation learning one area of machine learning where you transform text into a list of numbers. There are multiple algorithms for doing so. And for example, this is an output from, uh, from one of the algorithms. By the way, these algorithms have, when you, uh, the, the vectors that are outputted from the model have neat properties. For example, you can see that direction and uh, magnitude between king, queen, and man and woman are the same. So there is like semantic is preserved or verb and tense. Walking and swimming is on one part, walked and swam is another part. Or for example, countries and capitals. So uh, we can see that semantic uh, is embedded into these vectors. So my question is, can we use embeddings to cluster text? Like how time marker works. We have different kinds of text with different topics. Can we use embeddings? to do uh, clustering, which, which basically means putting different text, text with different topics in one bucket, in another bucket, etc. First answer is yes, since embeddings capture semantics, or two, no computers can't operate on embeddings. Yes. 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 That's true. As I told you, embeddings um, produce, um, and the algorithms that produce embeddings have, uh, the embeddings have semantics in them, so you would expect, for example, text that has that talks about sports will be in one part of the space. Text that talks about politics will be another part of the space. And then you can use basically the the most basic clustering algorithm that you can, that you can choose to find the boundaries that separates that space. And that's it. Something that we've used on Jarvis, which turned out to be pretty nice. Okay, neural machine translation. So neural machine translation uses neural networks. Duh. Uh, however, the network that I've shown you before, it's not suitable for such task. Why? Because in text, there is a sequential dependence between words. So for example, the, the third word can depend or can refer to the first word, etc., or maybe to some word that comes after it. Uh, vanilla neural networks do not take this sequential nature into account. 
So there are different kind of uh, architectures. One that is most that was my, uh, most widely used is recurrent neural network. And there are two types of recurrent neural networks. One is long short-term memory, and the other one is gated recurrent unit. As I, as I said, they can handle sequential data, plus they have a state inside of them. So when you input a word, the model will produce a word, but it will also update its state, so we can know, for example, later on how to process that information that was passed before. These are the models that, uh, that were used. So RNN on the left is the most basic one. LSTM and GRU are kind of, are more complicated, but they have three, for example, LSTM has three components that work interchangeably. The forgate gate, input gate, and output gate. You can think of them as a neural network, special kind of neural networks that do different tasks. And GRU has reset gate and update, update, update gate. I won't go into details, just so you can be aware of how it works. This is about networks that you use, but you need to have some kind of architecture, for example, to do um, uh, language translation. One kind of, or the architecture that you're using is the encoder-decoder architecture. What does this mean? You have one network, which is called the encoder. You have another network that's called the decoder. And the reason why we have two networks is that um, there is no, um, for example, input and output sequences can have different lengths. So, for example, if you, trans if you translate from English to French, it doesn't mean that uh, the if the input, for example, has 10 words, that the output also has 10 words. It can have maybe three words, right? So that's why you use two. Plus, the other, the other reason why you use two, uh, two networks is that there is no monotonic relationship, which means even if they had the same number of words, the first do not relate to the first one in the output, okay? Uh, LSTM are usually preferred because they capture long-range temporal dependencies. This is what I said before. If you have a word at the end that refers to the word in the beginning, for example, blah, 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 it, and it refers to some dog or animal in the beginning, then LSTMs perform better. Both these networks are jointly tuned uh, simultaneously. So when you learn uh, to translate, you tweak the parameters of both networks simultaneously. This is a graphical depiction of, of, of this encoder decoder decoder architecture. How it works is as follows. You have a sequence of words that you've previously <coughs> embedded, which means you've produced vectors for each word. Okay. Then you pass the first word to the encoder. The encoder outputs its internal state and outputs the, the word, but you discard that. Then you, then you pass the second word, output the state, the third word, output the state, and so forth. Once the last word is passed, the state is taken, and it's passed through the, to the decoder. You can think of this vector as a seed, so it seeds the decoder, um, and then the decoder does do uh, in autoregressively, basically um, executes the translation. So you first, oops, you first, you first seed the decoder, then it starts outputting words, the first word, second word, the third, etc., until a special word is outputted. For example, it can be a dot, or it can be a, a token like end of sentence token, whatever you like. Then the translation is completed, is completed, and you have the tokens that that the, that, that are expected in the in the output. This is what I've explained thus far, but there's one drawback. Imagine that you have a sentence that has one million words. You have to compress everything into one fixed length vector, which is unimaginable. So the question is, why not? By the way, you don't have to answer this one. <laughs> the question is, why not instead of one vector, the encoder produces multiple vectors, or all the states that it had for each different word, and you pass all of the states to the decoder, and then the decoder chooses which one to use, or which one to attend to, to produce the, the, the next word in the, in the translation. Et voila, this is the attention mechanism. So as I've told you, the first word produces a state, the second one, third, etc. Then you take all the vectors here, and you pass them through the decoder. So, um, I'll skip briefly into this part because I've, I've already talked about this. So you, you have the sequence, for example, 
I am happy. As a, a sentence. And you like to translate this into French. Okay? You tokenize it, which basically means split it into words or subword level. For example, you can you can take I am H A P would be one token and P Y would be other token. Because you have words that are, for example, uh, created by multiple words. And then you produce uh, vectors for each word. The same as before. X1, X2, and X3. Then, you have the encoder, which is bidirectional RNN. This is nothing more than a classical RNN. But the way it operates is you first pass the sentence in the usual order, then you reverse it and pass it in that order, because I told you some words can attend to later words. And then you, the output states of these two processes, you concatenate them. So at the output you have uh, H1, H2, and H3, which are double the usual states. These are called the annotations that you pass to the decoder. Now, since, I, since the decoder produces words autoregressively, which means it needs to see the, the word before to produce the word that's next. Let's see how, for example, it will produce the, the third word. So, so for the third word, Y3, the decoder, which is F, needs the previous word, Y2. It needs the context vector at 3 and the state vector at 3. This context vector is it's where attention uh, lies. The context vector is nothing more than a weighted sum. So you have weights, you multiply each of the hidden states that the encoder produced, and you add them together. So it's a sum of some weights and the hidden state. Okay? So these weights is what it's how the decoder chooses which one of the hidden states it needs to produce the word that, uh, that, that it's supposed to produce next. This is what I explained so far. And you basically now know how the attention mechanism works. So we can safely move to the transformer. This is the transformer. I'm going to go uh, through each of the components step by step. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop and ask me. It can get a bit tricky, but it's, it's, it's not that complicated. It, it has some math, maths inside, but if you understand thus far, you won't have any problem. So this is the transformer. It's also an encoder-decoder architecture. Okay, That's the first thing. This is the encoder, and this here is the decoder. The encoder has multiple, so here n, it's usually 12, of these components, of these blocks. The decoder also has multiples of these blocks. Uh, we'll go over each step, uh, in each, through each part step by step, but first let's see why the transformer is, uh, is better than, for example, the usual RNN. Uh, first, I mean, it's encoder-decoder, we've, we've talked about that. The, the, the other difference is that it completely relies on attention mechanism. So this thing, multi-head self-attention that you see here, this here, this here, they're all attention. Almost the same as the one, the weighted sum that we've described before. So since on, it only relies on attention, it's highly parallelizable. The previous RNNs produce word word by word, so we need the words in the beginning to produce the next word, which is sequential, and you cannot parallelize that. So these models are highly parallelizable, and uh, since they are parallelizable, you can train them really fast. Um, yeah, that, that's it. Those are the two reasons why you would uh, choose the transformer. Now, we are going to explain um, each of the components, but first let's start with the encoder. 
The same thing happens here. You have in the beginning an input sequence, for example, I am happy. You tokenize that with the tokens. And then you produce vectors, embeddings, for each of the work. Then you stack these, these embeddings on top of each other to produce one matrix. Okay? And this is the, the input to the model. So you take the work, you take the sentence, tokenize it, produce vectors, stack them on top, and you pass them to the network. But since the model performs, uh, I mean, operates on the full sentence simultaneously, we need to add some kind of information about position, that the first embedding comes before, before the second, and the third, and so on. How we do that is we produce another matrix, P, which is this one. This is basically the matrix that the model uses, but visualized. So these um, yellow, were, I mean, yellow values are higher, the, uh, the, the darker ones are lower. How these um, values are produced is nothing more than you, choose, you use sine and cosine function interchangeably. So on odd position, on even positions, you have sine of the row number, divided by some normalization constant that has the column value inside of it. Then on the odd position, you have cosine of r over some normalization factor that has c, and so on and so forth. That's how you produce this matrix. It's an easy way. You can choose, your, you can choose a way to, to add positional information yourselves, but this is the one that, that's used in the, in the usual, in the, in the earliest implementation. So you take your matrix X, which was in the input, and you add your positional information. Okay. Then, this is where, as I've told you in the beginning, since the transformer is also a neural network, it transforms the data in a special way. So here you have the input matrix X with the added positional information. You take this matrix and you transform it to produce the following matrices. The queries, the keys, and the values. This concept is borrowed from recommender systems. You write something in the browser, for example, show me cute pictures of dogs, or pictures of cute dogs. <laughs> and that query is compared with a lot of entries in a database. Those are, those are the keys, and for each of those keys, you, you have a value, basically how close is that to the, to the query. How you, multi, how, how, you choose, how you operate on these matrices is you take the, the queries and the keys and you multiply them together. Then you normalize them by the, the size of the, of, the, of, the, of the vectors inside of this block. This is used to, to improve the, the training procedure. There is something that is called uh, the vanishing gradient, where, for example, if the value of these entries in this matrix is high, the model will, will train really, really slow. So you need to lower it down a bit, so in order to train faster. Then you take this softmax, something that I've talked to you about, and you multiply the output of this with the values. This is the first transformation on the input matrix. Okay. And this is called the attention between the queries, keys, and values. <laughs> now, if we only had one set of matrices, queries, keys, and values, the words will attend to, to, our, to, to themselves. So for example, in the example uh, that we had, I am happy, when you translate it, M will attend to itself. Happy will attend to itself. I will attend to itself. But we, we would like to choose, we would like to enable the model to attend, each word to attend to, to another word. This is multi head self attention. It's basically the same principle, but instead of, instead of one output here, what we do is we take the queries. We multiply them by 
some matrix. So we basically transform them somewhere. We take the keys, we multiply them by another transform transformation matrix. And we take the values, multiply them by another transformation matrix. And we do attention. Okay, this is the i-th tension, the i-th head. And we can do as much as we like, for example, 32. Then we take all the outputs, let's say h1, h2, dot, 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 h32. We co concatenate them. We multiply them with another matrix, and then that is the output. Okay. So nothing fancy, another transformation, we just multiply stuff, nothing fancy. By the way, these weights here, the weights that were, the matrices that were used to produce these key squares values, these are all the parameters that the model has, and these are the numbers, the huge numbers that you've seen, like 5,300 billion parameters. So you have a lot of matrices with a lot of values that you have to learn. Then, We've talked about um, the self-attention. We just take the input to this component. We add, we add the, the transformed one. And then we normalize. This is, this is used. It's also kind of a regularization where the model can choose whether to use the transformed values or the original values. This is like the residual networks that you've seen in, in, in computer view. Now, you have a vanilla neural network, the, the one the exactly the same that I showed you in the beginning, which basically takes the matrix X, passes through this neural network, and produces the, the transform value. Exactly the same thing, you have normalization, uh, you take the transformed matrix from the network plus the untransformed one, you add them together, and then you normalize. Again, uh, residual connections. So the model can choose whether to use the, the output of the network or the, un, the, the untransformed one. That's the encoder. I know it looks scary, but it's not. There are only matrices that you multiply them together in a predictive fashion, uh, such that when the output of uh, of each block is transformed in a in a way that it can it can produce the, the results that we want, and it's it's exactly the same with every neural network. A bunch of transformation on the input here. The decoder, it's almost exactly almost exactly the same as the as the decoder, with one addition. It's the masked multi-head attention. Uh, because the decoder produces words autoregressively, which means words word after word. This is the decoder. The encoder is produced parallel, par in parallel fashion, but the decoder produces words one after another. But you have as input the whole the whole sequence. With for example, if you translate a sentence sentence into French, you have word one, which was translated word two, which was translated, and then some words that were not translated, but have, have to be filled in. We would like the model to not attend to those words, because we don't know them, OK? So that, that's why you have this mask multi-head self-attention. It's exactly the same. We have the queries multiplied by the keys, but plus you add a mask factor, which basically is one, one, one for the words it has seen, and then zeros. It's not, it's semantically similar to this, to this. Then you have the same uh, multi-head self-attention as the one from the, from the encoder. But the thing is that here you, you initialize the queries and keys with, with the queries and keys of the last block of the encoder because we would like to add some, some of the information, some, some of the attention from the, from the input sequence, right? So we, we don't want the translation to only attend to itself, but to attend also to the input sequence. 
And at the top of the decoder, you have what we call a head. So the output of the decoder is also a matrix X. Now we would like to project this matrix. Let's say this matrix X is in, uh, has, for example, 100 by 768 dimension. We would like to go from 100 by 768 to one, to a vector which has one, uh, one row and the size of the vocab vocabulary, the number of words that, that we have. And finally, we pass this vector, which, which is unnormal. The, the values here are unnormalized. You, we, you pass this through a softmax function to obtain a probability distribution. And the value that has high, the, 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 the value, the vector that has high, highest probability is the word that, that needs to be translated. Okay? That's it. You know how transformer works. <laughs> so, I can give you a short depiction. So, you have the encoder. You input the stacked vectors of the, of the words. You get the queries and keys from the last layer. Here you have the decoder. You use this as a seed to initialize the, the attention there. Then you get the input y, and then you produce probability for each word. I'll go over uh, a data flow, so how, how the model works, it, without going into details about how, how the transformation is done, because we've talked about that before. So the assumption is that we had we have an, a transformer that was trained to translate from English to French, and we would like to translate the input sentence "Hello world" into "Bonjour le monde." Now, at the encoder, at the encoder, we first tokenize the sentence into different words. We produce vectors for each word and stack them together to a matrix X. We add the positional into positional information into this matrix and the resulting matrix is passed through the through the encoder. At the decoder phase, we take the queries and the keys from the last block. We initialize uh, them, we use them to initialize the attention in the decoder. And then we create a special list of tokens, which it has the beginning of sentence token in, uh, inside of it, just that one. Then we do exactly the same procedure. We take the tokens, we embed them, we add the positional information, and then we pass this, this matrix through the decoder. Then the decoder produces a matrix, transform matrix, blah, blah, blah. We project it into a vector. We pass that through a softmax function to obtain a probability distribution. And the word in this position is the next word. For example, bonjour. Then we add this token in this list, and we do the same procedure. We create the embeddings, we add positional information, we pass them to the decoder, the decoder spits out a matrix, we project it into a vector, we normalize the, the values, and then we, we find which one is the largest inside, and that's the word, the next word. And after some time, the end of sentence token will appear, and that's how we finish with, with the translation. Okay. Finally, just uh, an image of the full architecture. Okay. Nemo. Može nam makijanski sjeti? Da, da. Proces podelje kod vladelo. Bilo je ideja da je kompočno da se koristi transformerom s 
Конкретно не, немам видено примера, меѓу тоа зашто да не, на инпут би имал реченица или те или слика или било што која е ноист, на аутпут имаш иста да слика која е диноист. Се надеваме дека моделот ќе научи параметри така што диноизинг ќе биде ќе биде успешен. Така е. Да, да, да. Или на пример за супер резолушен, ако е сликата помала да се зголеми. Или еден куп таск кој мислам се решава, моментов не знам што што себе може да се реши, меѓу тоа гледам пример, искрено. Исто имам видено како поестар за генерирање синтетичка дата. Да. Ако има некој мал дата се, дел од дата генерирани процес на колучени дата, генерира поголема дата се. Да. Тоа е известно. Да, сосема а сосема нешто што може да се да се реши. Кон конкретно тој пример што го покажав со дали, а моделот е премал, значи да да може да да продуцира слики кои што кои што се минифул. Меѓутоа на интернет ако пишете дали и стварно има слики кои се ја дистингуваше од 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 нешто човек што би нацрзал или би сликал било како. Така да може комплетно да се користи за генерирање на на нови за да таа уметничка. Може, не е? Јас сакам да те прашам во врска со почетните неколку слајда. Спомена на почетокот дека моделите стануваат се поголеми, спомена дури до неколку милијарди параметри дека земаат во обзир. Генерално нели за такви модели да се изпредира потребно е многу хардвер. Па ме интересира твое мислење, да ја мислиш дека има некаков начин да се оптимизира се? Да. Значи... Постои начин да се реши тој проблем, пошто нели си ов принтот на користење на, на таков хадвер е... Сеја, не знам конкретно за Мегатрон, ама бројките се во 100 GPUs што се имаат користено и тренинг ауърс ов, не знам, недела дена, така што си ов принт е стварно голем. Оно што прават за day-to-day -day use, новија трансформери е, ако веќе имаш некој модел што е огромен, земаш модел што е помал од тој модел и сега, Големиот модел се нарекува teacher, малиот модел се нарекува student. Student моделот го тренираш така што ќе се однесува како teacher модел. И тоа всушност се нарекува model distillation и всушност тоа е и името на, на презентација Transformer Distilled. Односно го разглобивме буквално за во нај во нај во нај малите дела. ги тренираат во различни режими како zero shot few shot learning кај што се користат или да кај кај zero shot конкретно не се внесува пример моделот не ни гледа слика не ни гледа инпут конкретен не го гледа некаков опис на, на тој инпут и целта е да предвиди параметри на тој инпут така што нели тие параметри се одредуваат на на тој инпут не знам на пример ако сака да сака да да, да, да класифицира слики нема да одпутни тигар него ќе одпутни животно со црвено жолти стрипс. Тие режими се користат за 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 како исто за регуларизација. На страна од овие тропал што има на сека да значи. Ќе се. Епа, тешки ајде на забава.